video is broadcast on LSL Podcast Channel. Thank you for listening. Please subscribe to the channel. Raymond Arroyo sitting in for Laura Ingram. Big news coming out of the Boy Scouts of America. The Boy Scouts announced plans yesterday that they would accept girls for the first time in their 100-year history. Um, this is the latest move to adapt the organization's rules to an era of declining membership. Now, Laura, by the way, is going to be back shortly. She had a, a quick hit she had to do for her Billionaire at the Barricades book. Of course, best-selling book out at bookstores now. Uh, she's on the book tour. She's in Philadelphia tonight. She's going to be in Myrtle Beach, uh, Lynchburg, Virginia on Friday. Uh, it's going to be amazing. You'll be able to hear some of that. We'll go live from Lynchburg on Friday. So I'm delighted to sit in for just a little bit until Laura gets here. She'll be here momentarily. But this story, th th this arrested my attention instantly. You know, both of my boys were scouts. Um, and we hear now the Boy Scouts are changing the rules to allow girls. Here's the justification from the Boy Scouts, Michael Cherbaugh of the Boy Scout leadership. reason for the change is that our parents have asked for options to serve their whole family. They will have the opportunities for an advancement track that is identical to Boy Scouting, but maintains the opportunities for them to have leadership with their own girl gender. Now, their own girl gender. What What is he talking about? Now, I don't know about you, but my daughter never wanted to be a Boy Scout. She never wanted to be a Boy Scout. You know why? She was a brownie. She's a brownie. She wants to be a Girl Scout. The reason the Boy Scouts hit the, 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 the ravine on membership and it started to plummet from 6% and then down and down and down is because of what? Do you remember? Remember 2013. That's when the Scouts ended their ban on openly gay Scouts and the prohibition on gay troop leaders in 2015. It's not a mystery. This is why it happened. Now, look, they were lauded at the time. Many people said, look, it's a new day for scouting, blah, 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 blah. But I, I, I think in the, in the notion to try to socially engineer and make everybody feel good, we forgot this was about kids teaching boys what it means to be a man, to prepare them for, to invoke the founder of Boy Scouts. And the reason it was founded in England 100 years ago, it was to instill a sense of Christian manhood duty patriotism responsibility in a young boy's life that's what it was about the hiking and the tying knots and 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 the 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 pine wood derby it was to teach a boy the skills he'll need as he matures into a man now we have girls coming into boys are the girl scouts soon going to be opening girl scouts to boys can 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 we bake cookies and you know, knit dresses and do the things Girl Scouts do. I'm trying to think what my daughter does in brownies, and I'm bl I'm having a blank. Because uh, they do, th I, I get that they do similar things. You know, they go on hikes. They have cookouts sometimes. But it's a different emphasis because it's boys or girls doing it. Mariella had this little, my daughter, this little bridge ceremony. They had to go over a bridge, I remember. And on the other side of the bridge, they got some metal or some badge. Um, the Boy Scouts didn't do that. Because they didn't need a little ceremony where everybody applauded them. 855-40-LAWYER, 855-405-2872. Is your daughter, or has your daughter, complained about wanting to be a scout? Has she been agitating because she felt cut off somehow from the full experience of childhood by not being permitted to join the Boy Scouts? See, I don't know why people would want to be a member of things they're not. It would be like me wanting to join the Presbyterian Guild. I'm Catholic. Why do you want to be a member of that? A ditto for the Presbyterian. He doesn't want to be, you know, in the Catholic Guild of the Bleeding Virgin. You know, that's not where he's going to end up. Groups are here to define who we are. It's an expression of who we are. But I, I got to tell you, when I saw this story, it, it, first of all, as a former Boy Scout, it kind of made me sick because... It, it's a time in your life, particularly when you're a Cub Scout, and that's what they're talking about now. They're going to open up the Cub Scouts. Uh, the board unanimously approved this from the Washington Post. 
a decision to allow girls into the Cub Scouts program, which will eventually allow them to earn the prestigious Eagle Scout ranking. After years of requests from families and girls themselves, were you families agitating for this? What girl wanted to be a Boy Scout? I want to hear from you, too. I want to understand, because I don't. You have Girl Scouting. That is why Girl Scouting was created. You know what my problem is with all this? We are not all the same. We are not all the same. Girls are not boys, and boys are not girls. And the gender homogenization, I don't, I don't think, will work. I, I guess people are going to try it. But, the, the, you know, the Boy Scouts, uh, let's go to that Charles Garcia. We have Charles Garcia. I want to go to him first. Um, he is a Girl Scouts leader on the board of directors. And um, he's suggesting that, well, <laughs> the Girl Scouts don't like this policy. Any parent that let their girl join the Boy Scouts would be putting them at risk. Ooh given the fact they haven't fixed the fire burning in their house right now. Would you, would you parents, allow your daughter to join the Boy Scouts? And have you pulled your sons out of Boy Scouts because of the policy decisions in 2013, 2015? Opening it to uh, openly gay Boy Scouts and openly gay troop leaders in 2015. Uh, this is a piece from... The American Independent Institute, uh, when they, when the Boy Scout, there was a, an exodus apparently out of um, Boy Scouts following those decisions I talked about. A lot of church groups pulled the Boy Scouts out completely. The Mormon Church pulled, you know, uh, 185,000 kids out of Boy Scouts. Uh, Franklin Graham called all churches across the U.S. to pull people out. This is, and this was in May. Um, and it's gone on and on. I mean, there there have been marked declines in membership, and that's what that's what Charles Garcia is referencing when he says the Boy Scouts have not put out the fire in their own house. I, you know, it's a hundred and five years that uh, the the Girl Scouts have been in existence. Okay, and the Boy Scouts, I think, one hundred and six. Uh, this is the from the uh, Lisa. Margosian. She's the chief customer officer of the Girl Scouts. They felt blindsided by this announcement that the Boy Scouts were going to permit girls in. We've had 105 years of supporting girls and girl-only safe space. So much of a girl's life is a life where she is in a co-ed environment, and we have so much research and data to suggest that girls really thrive in an environment where they can experiment, take risk, and stretch themselves in the company of other girls. That makes sense to me. That's the same reason Boy Scouts works. Because they're not trying to impress anybody. They can make mistakes. They're doing so in a fraternity or, in the case of girls, surrounded by, by uh, their peers without having to worry about the girl-boy thing. I was disturbed by this, and I'm apparently not alone. For some parents, the announcement came as an answer to long-standing complaints, according to the New York Times. The problem with the Girl Scout curriculum is that it's very focused on who your leader is for your particular troop. Uh, mother Re Rebecca says, Tella, a mother of four in Canton, Michigan, said, if you have a mom who's really into crafts and girly stuff and being a princess, then that's what your Girl Scout troop is going to be like. If you have a daughter who's more rough and tumble, it's not going to be a good fit. Well, I'm not so sure about that. I mean, my, 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 my little girl, they went on hikes. They went on, you know, they, she's not a, I mean, she's girly, but she also, because she has two brothers at home, can be rough too. We'll get into this. 855-40-LAURA, 855-405-2872. Uh, we've got Sean Duffy coming up, Representative Sean Duffy of Wisconsin. We're going to talk about uh, the tax plan. We're going to talk about the savage attacks on the president uh, continuing. The, the morning Joe this morning was unbelievable. We're going to play a little bit of that in the next block. Um, as you know, the president has taken on, gone on this crusade to push back against fake news. 
Uh, you've got the Russian investigation going on. MSNBC is calling for his impeachment. I mean, it is a drumbeat, nary a word about Harvey Weinstein and those who were complicit in enabling him. But boy, do we have, do, is there a lot of bloviating about impeachment and the 25th Amendment and oh, it was on and on and on this morning. We're going to get into that as well. Speaker Paul Ryan is coming up in the next hour, and Adam Carolla, appropriately enough, we're going to be talking about masculinity, what it means to be a man. Every line is lit up, as I imagined it would be. Uh, I'm going to take one call, and then we're going to go to break. Tamara, line one, you want to say what? What about Girl Scouts? Hi. Um, Hi. Do you like this idea of the Boy Scouts opening themselves to girls? No. Uh, no, not necessarily. Um, I just wanted to give a perspective on why I think part of the part of some of the women don't want their kids or don't want to be involved in, in Girl Scouts. Um, I was a Girl Scout. I did the brownie thing. I did the going over the bridge and all that. Okay. Stuff. And I, I found it absolutely cloying. Um, I felt like I was a Barbie doll and I was being dressed up, and I felt that the approach was very. Um, uh, deadening to my interests. Um, mm-hmm. So it wasn't I, feeding I, your interests. If I had had the, uh, um, well, I was really much more interested in nature and naturalism and a lot of the things woodcraft that, that the boys, the Boy mm-hmm. Scouts offered that Girl Scouts did not offer at all, emphasis mm-hmm. wise. And I, I, and I really do want to say it's the emphasis. Okay, but Tamara, but what you're talking about is a need to reform the Girl Scouts, not wanting to be a Boy Scout. I mean, would you have wanted to be a Boy Scout as a girl? Tamara? She hung up. Maybe she didn't like the question. That, that, that is the question, though. I, I, look, I get it. I didn't, I, I'll, I'll be full, you want me to full, I'm going to give you full disclosure. While we're all unveiling our pasts. I hated Boy Scouts. I didn't like being a Cub Scout. I didn't like being a Weeblow. I didn't even like the title. And then I didn't like being a Boy Scout. (laughs) It's true. You know what I hated most of all? The kerchief. You had that stupid kerchief with that little brass ring. Come on. See, I didn't like that. But there were skills I learned in Boy Scouts that I still, how to tie knots. There are still knots I use today. Um... Uh, the, 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 the focusing on a project and finishing it, even if you're not particularly interested in it. I didn't want to sit there carving wood all day. I mean, truth of the matter is my father, who was the mechanic, he was much better at doing the Pinewood Derby than I was. All I did really was paint it and put a weight in the bottom. Do you know you can put weights? You're not supposed to, but we like embedded the weight say, in the bottom. Isn't that illegal? <laughs> I think it is. We, we, and we won like every year. Oh, he, Shocking. My, my father should have been a car manufacturer. It was scary. He would, that thing was like quick, right out. Not only did it go down the track, went right through the wall on the other side of the cafeteria. Amazing. No, it was, he, we would put little lead things in there. You can weight them, but I think there's like a limit or something or so much. But he was very sneaky. He'd cut a little hole in the bottom, like pull it out, put the liquid lead in, then put the wood back. You'd never see it. It was amazing. Anyway, you learn a lot of things. In Boy Scouts, but like how to cheat at derby races, right? But I would never have wanted to be a Girl Scout because I like cookies, for instance. I love Thin Mints. Thin Mints, I adore Thin Mints. I I blow hundreds of dollars on Thin Mints. There's not a grocery store during cookie season that I miss if there's a Thin Mint and a Girl Scout out there. I will go drop dollars on on that Girl Scout because I love Thin Mints. But I never wanted to be a Girl Scout. All right, we're going to talk about this much more. We're also going to get into the president last night with Hannity uh, taking on the media establishment, unveiling a tax plan. Is it working? We're going to get into all of this, but I first want to hear about, do you do your daughters want to be Boy Scouts? And conversely, if they like Thin Mints, would your boys want to be a Girl Scout? It's really equal in my mind. It's the same question. 855-40-LAURA, 855-40-LAURA. We will be right back. Raymond Arroyo sitting in for Laura, and she's going to be here before you know it. We'll be right back. Have you ever felt tricked or deceived into buying something? Nothing is worse than being lied to by a salesman. 
Well, many timeshare owners know exactly that feeling. If you made a big mistake and bought a timeshare you now regret, there's hope for you out there. You can finally undo that crooked contract and start putting that money back into your wallet. Why keep paying for something you no longer want to use? If you want out of that timeshare forever, contact my friends at resortrelease.com. They'll legally and permanently end that timeshare contract guaranteed. That's a money-back guarantee, and if you don't get out of your timeshare, you don't pay a penny. They're Better Business Bureau accredited, A-plus rated, and they get the job done. So stop paying for that timeshare you felt like you were scammed into purchasing. Visit resortrelease.com or call 855-66-LAURA. That's 855-66-LAURA. 2018's maintenance fee bills will arrive any day now. Get out now before you pay that fee. Visit resortrelease.com or call them at 855-66-LAURA to see if you qualify. Raymond Arroyo sitting in for Laura Ingram. She'll be back any minute. Um, I want to I want to get uh, right to the phones. Uh, let's go to Chase. You wanted to say what? Chase in Michigan. Quickly. Structure in place. Yeah, Raymond, I got a 14-year-old that's a Boy Scout, and his, his seven-year-old warrior princess sister came to us last year when they advertised Girl Scouts at her school, and she was like, well, I want to join the Girl Scouts. But in talking to other parents that actually went to the Girl Scout meeting, they were like, this is suffocating, and they're not even doing the stuff that, uh, that the Boy Scouts get to do. And I, I looked at the board of directors, um, and it's like Hillary Clinton. Uh, sorry, I think we lost Chase there. But he, he was saying that it was promote the Girl Scouts, in his mind, were promoting liberal causes, so the girls weren't interested. But again, your princess warrior daughter does not want to be a Boy Scout. She just might not want to be a Girl Scout. That's not the same thing. Reform Girl Scouts. By the way, there are campfire girls. There are trailway girls. There are other girl nature uh, hiking organizations where they can learn skills that might not be come with the baggage that girls. This is Girl Scout Aaliyah Braddock. She's 10 years old, and I asked her a very simple question and got a very direct answer. Would you want to be a Boy Scout? No. She and her mom, Jada, agreed to talk to us. It's bringing out who she really is. Because the idea of Boy Scouts now accepting girls is not an acceptable idea, at least for them. But to say they can join, for me personally, I'm not going to do that. My daughter's going to stay in Girl Scouts. I think it's what's best for her. Okay, and that those mother and daughter responding to this new development that the Boy Scouts are now welcoming for the first time in more than 100 years, girls into their ranks. Do you like this idea? Raymond Arroyo sitting in for Laura Ingram, who will be bounding in any moment billionaire at the barricades out in bookstores everywhere now then she's out on tour i'll be joining her for a few of the stops we'll have fun uh in philadelphia tonight lynchburg virginia and myrtle beach on friday west palm beach uh the following week go to lauraingram.com all the tour dates there chase in michigan you wanted to say what we lost you earlier i think Chase is not there. Let's go to Ken in Michigan. Ken, you wanted to say. Oh, there you are, Chase. Go ahead. Chase, I, I, we can't hear you on this connection. Let's go to Ken. Ken in Michigan. Go ahead. Yeah, you know, it's, it's a sad microcosm of what's happening around the country. I mean, Boy Scouts used to be about building good young men of character. Right. And well-rounded. And, and I'm a former uh, scoutmaster and an Eagle Scout. I left after their last decision. I mean, they lost, started to lose their moral compass in the 70s. It came back in the 80s, and they've completely squashed it now. But they used to have a program called Explorer Scouts that admitted girls of 14 years of age and older for who wanted to be more tomboyish or do more boy-like things. Mm. They had Explorer programs. So this is, this is nothing more than the Boy Scouts capitulating to, to political correctness and a dying program. Yeah, well, obviously they're in trouble. They're trying to build up leadership or, or membership, rather, um, at the at the expense of leadership, actually. And the question is, should they have just refounded themselves by digging down and 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 uh, tapping into their tradition? Maybe that would have stemmed the tide and stopped the membership outflow, rather than changing their mission entirely. Thank you, Ken, for the comment. Crystal in Arizona. Your thoughts on would would your daughter want to join Boy Scouts? Well, no. Um, I was a brownie and a Girl Scout in the '60s. It was very much focused for girls. Uh, maybe that's why I became a nurse. I don't know. My <laughs> daughter was a Girl Scout in the '80s. She went spelunking. She went 
rock climbing. You know, she did a lot of things that I certainly didn't have an opportunity to do, nor did I want to do. She is the ultimate tomboy, the ultimate athlete. Um, now she's 34, but the Girl Scouts were great for her. She got to do everything that she wanted. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, uh, you see, this is the experience we've certainly had. I mean, if you have Girl Scouts and the girls have that outlet where they can both be girly and do crafty things and, you know, sell cookies and still climb rocks with girls and not boys looking at them, you know, uh, 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 comparing them. Because let's face it. Girls' physicalities and boys' physicalities are different things. There are things a boy can do on a, you know, climbing a rock that a girl might not be able to do at a certain age, and she can probably tie a bow or a or a, a knot a lot faster than a boy. So I, I, I like the idea of having them segregated by their by their um, uh, sexes at that age because it gives them that space and opportunity to learn. That makes sense to me. Nathan, Virginia, you wanted to say what? Hey, I wanted to ask you, is the Girl Scouts of America allowing boys to no. come join their program? No, they're not. They're not well, doing it. Well, why not? That, that's sexist. <laughs> well, that's you see, not being very, very... I, actually, Nathan, the Boy Scouts, the Girl Scouts have the right idea, which is we are here for girls. Girls only may apply. And that's why we call ourselves the Girl Scouts. It's like the Knights of Columbus permitting, you know, uh, Baptists in, or the, the 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 Southern Baptist Convention allowing, uh, you know, uh, 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 I don't know what in Buddhists into their ranks. Be who you say you are. I think that's the we're losing a sense of identity in America. We're not sure of who we are, and that makes not only for rattled and uncertain adults. But it makes for rattled and uncertain kids. And when you're shaping young people, when you're shaping young lives, it's important to have a strong sense of identity. You, my son, are going to be a strong, committed, socially vibrant and, and, and citizen that will contribute to this society. But you will be a man in that society. And you, my daughter, are going to be this amazing woman who can do amazing things. And you, too, are going to be who you are. And we're going to help you find that person. But we're not going to try to make you who you aren't. And I don't like this. I mean, to my eye, this is scout cross-dressing. That's what it is. And it might make people feel good for a short term, but... I don't see how it it is it is it is out of step with what is intrinsically and naturally already in place. And there are things boys, you know, I had the same complaints when the Catholic Church decided they were going to open the altar servers up to girls. And the reason I was opposed to it was twofold. I still don't like it. I don't like girls serving a priest on an altar. I don't like the look of that. I don't like it. It also does, it undermines something. And by the way, I'd love to see the numbers on this. The numbers of altar boys, I would bet, also decreased because I had two nephews who were altar boys at the time. Suddenly the little girls showed up. Well, little girls are poor. They know exactly how much wine to pour in or just how much water and just how to arrange the napkin over their shoulder. They can do that stuff perfectly because it's instinctive to them. A boy has to be taught through discipline, that precise, boys are gangly and goofy and doing their own thing. But the altar servers program taught a boy to be attentive to those details in his worship of God. And also put him in a position where he could be close to a priest who could mentor. And you're looking at him and go, wow, I could be a priest someday. That was the idea of the altar servers. Now you've got girls there looking to something they can never be, a priest, and serving the guy on the altar. I don't like the image of it, and I think... The formation of the child is kind of thrown off by the program. Just my own little bias. And I think it, it, it has implications also in the scouting program. We are going to take a break. Sean Duffy straight ahead. Laura Ingram coming into the studio. We'll be right back. We all want gorgeous model-like hair. And I'm going to tell you how to get it. Ovation Cell Therapy will help get your hair back into condition. Thicker, stronger, healthier-looking hair is yours if you make the right hair care decisions with Ovation. Did you know that Ovation Cell Therapy is clinically proven to repair over 75% of split ends and also reduce breakage after just one use? Ovation Cell Therapy will help get your hair back into condition, and it's risk-free with a 365-day, 100% money-back guarantee. 
No one does that except Ovation because it's that good. So what are you waiting for? Your new hair awaits. Join the Ovation Nation as I did long ago. All you have to do is go to OvationHair.com. Remember, select Laura Ingram in the survey at checkout for a special new customer discount and a free shipping offer for a limited time. Get details at OvationHair.com and select Laura Ingram in the checkout for your new customer discount. Hurry, the free shipping offer ends soon. Wait. Time is running out for the GenuCell warehouse clearance sale from Chamonix. And you have to call right now. You get double your order of GenuCell free. This is awesome. That's right, free. GenuCell is a natural plant stem cell treatment. Has all those great peptides, those bags, that puffiness under your eyes. I got some right now, by the way. I, I slap. Oh, yeah, no. I'm. And then you have the uh, GenuCell's immediate effect, so you're going to see the results quickly. You know it. I know it. It's the best. If you haven't gotten it before, this is your chance. The best customer service in the business. By the way, it has a 60-day, 100% money-back guarantee. And there's all these other gifts that you get. You get the deep firming serum. Two months supply of that free. You call in the next two months, uh, two, uh, 20 minutes, excuse me, and you get the Esotique RF, which is another great uh, wrinkle treatment. You're going to love all this. It, it Total it all up. It's four free gifts. This is what you have to do. Do it now. Write it down. 800-480-5206. That's 800-480-5206. Genucel. Order now. You get a surprise luxury gift free. 800-480-5206. To the Laura Ingram Show, 855-40-LAURA. Trump lit it up yesterday. He was on fire uh, in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, uh, talking to the American Trucking Association. I used to actually write speeches for the Secretary of Transportation all those years ago in the Reagan administration. And I remember writing a lot of speeches for the uh, ATA. And Trump goes there and he's... Says so like, what would we? Where would we be without you truckers? Where would we be without you guys? You guys get it working for the United States for for commerce every day, and we've got to get this tax code simplified. Bring the rates down. We're going to even zero out rates for some Americans. It was great, and of course, all this gets overlooked because the media wants to gin up. Oh, Trump! Trump doesn't believe in the First Amendment. Trump thinks think the Constitution should be should be uh, suspended for for the press and blah blah blah. Joining us now, Congressman Sean Duffy, one of our great friends here on the Laura Ingram Show, who is a steward, a fiscal steward of our economy, because he believes that Congress should now take a, its time to reform programs that waste money. And this is all part of this new approach to our economy and taxes, and he joins us now. Congressman, it's great to talk to you. How are you doing today? I am doing well, Laura. Thanks for having me on. It's good Ab- to be with you. Absolutely, and congratulations to your wife, uh, Rachel, who is going to be uh, working with Fox on the weekends with Fox and Friends, and that's coming up soon. I mean, she's going to be more famous than you now, you know, Sean. She, listen, she already is. People uh, always yeah, want her point. to come to events and not me. So I'm, <laughs> I'm already the second, uh, the second string act. Ex- excellent point. Let's, let's talk uh, very briefly about what the uh, president said yesterday about tax reform. Everybody's asking me, uh, every time I go on a, an appearance and a show for, for uh, my new book, they're saying, well, are they going to get tax reform done? Are they going to get it done? Are they going to get it done? So are they going to get it done, Congressman? That, that's a million dollar question, right? So I, we'll get it done in the House. Uh, the question becomes, can the dysfunctional, um, disorganized Senate actually act on tax reform? And, uh, the reason I'm going to tell you I'm hopeful, um, and bullish on tax reform is because these senators, the ones who have not been part of this movement of reform in the way Washington works, they've gone home, uh, they've gone home in August. Um, they go home on the weekends, and their constituents, the people that have walked doors from them more, the ones that gave them 25 yeah. bucks to run their first campaign and hugging door knockers for them, they've come home, these senators, and they're getting lit up by their constituents. Their best friends, their best supporters are so frustrated with them. They're coming back to Washington with, I think, a renewed sense of purpose to actually get this done. And if they don't, um, this, is, this for the Republican Party will be like 2006. We will get absolutely destroyed. Crushed. Who's going to show up and vote for a Republican? When you didn't do health care, you didn't do tax, you didn't do any of the things that you ran on and promised your constituents that you would do, no one's going to come and vote for you. That'll be an absolute failure. So I, I, I do think it's going to, I do think it's going to get done. Uh, we're talking to Sean Duffy, Congressman of Wisconsin, here on the Laura Ingram Show. Later on, we're going to deal, uh, deal with his colleague and talk to uh, Speaker Ryan. Looking forward to talking to him about, uh, he's giving a big speech today about tax cuts. It looks like, it looks like Ryan on this issue of tax reform and the White House are on the same page. Am I getting that analysis correct? So you, you have that right. And what, as you, as, as you know, um, the failure of health care was when the House jumped out first and tried to lead the White House and the Senate. Mm-hmm. That didn't work well for us. 
So now the plan, we learned from that, and the plan was to bring in the tax leaders from the House, the Senate, and the White House and put out this framework that everyone could buy into. Um, and, and, and Paul Ryan and the president have been working hand in glove in what this package should look like, what kind of reform do we get, what should brackets be. Um, so, no, they're, they're working together, um, which is, again, that, that's, a, that's, um, that's a recipe for success. And you, you played the clip of President Trump yesterday, Laura. Um, President Trump is the best salesman for tax reform. Um, he, he, can, he can take tax reform and bring it to why is this relevant for everyday Americans? Why does tax reform help you with your job or your salary or your opportunity with your family? And he has to do more of these. He can't just do one every week or every two weeks. He has to do two or three a week and drive this message on why tax reform is so important. And because you know that if you win the debate, it's far easier to win the votes. If you're losing the debate on taxes and the Chuck right. Schumer um, idea of what tax reform is, which is just tax giveaways for the rich and corporations, it's far harder to get the votes that you need in the Senate. So um, President Trump has to lead this charge, and he's the best at it. So I hope, I, I hope he does more of what he did yesterday um, and multiple times a week. Yesterday, uh, the president spoke out uh, both with Sean Hannity and uh, on Twitter about the press and how it is. And, and today he continued talking about the fake news is going all out in order to demean and denigrate. Uh, it's such hatred. The left is now saying that what he really doesn't understand is the Constitution, that he's going to make a run at the First Amendment, and uh, he's threatening NBC's licenses. Uh, what would you advise the president on this? Do you think these tweets and these comments are helpful or counterproductive? So, yeah, um, I, I usually am one who supports his tweets. He, he's able to drive the news cycle. He's able to reach millions of people through his Twitter sphere. I think it was a bridge too far to talk about taking away licenses from major news corporations. I think he's done a great job of basically discrediting them, showing and pointing out that uh, their news coverage is fake news or it's one-sided news coverage. And when they lose credibility, they lose viewership. That's what really the president has to go after with regard to the media. But uh, to make a claim that um, we're going to take their license away, you got to think of this. What happens if Barack Obama was – would go um, crazy. In the, it, 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 we'd go, well, Fox News isn't giving me great coverage. No. I want to take away their license. I mean, no. You've got you to think of the flip side of these things. You know, we want to open and, and, and aggressive press. And if they're not fair, if the, president, the president was, on, uh, I think it was with Hannity and basically said, no one really knows what the truth is. But I do. I know the truth because they're talking about me. I was in the meeting that they're reporting on. And this is fake. It's false. Um, so he's the one in the best position to actually disseminate the truth, despite what the media is trying to drive. And, and beyond that, like I, I, I'm from central and northern Wisconsin. Um, we're, we're, the, we're the district uh, in rural Wisconsin that drove a, a Trump victory in Wisconsin for the first time since 1984 for a Republican. And if you look back to my district, people aren't looking at what the media says about Donald Trump. They look at the results and whether it's a, a 3.1 percent GDP or uh, stock market up, unemployment down, border security, Keystone Pipeline. We're, we're, we're mining coal again, which, by the way, is Wisconsin's right. coal reliant. Um, we're crushing ISIS, building up our military. This is all good. All the, this is great stuff, and they see that. Um, and they're ecstatic about Donald Trump actually focused on their safety, their security, their family, the economy. their economy, their pocketbook. Duffy we're, right. Duffy, we're out of time. Congressman Sean Duffy on The Laura Ingram Show. Phenomenal performance. Keep your eye on the prize. Don't step on your own message, Mr. President. You are listening to The Laura Ingram Show, 855-40-LAURA. The president versus the press. Good idea, bad idea for the president to take off on CNN, MSNBC, The New York Times, Washington Post, kind of all of them. I worked for President Reagan, and President Reagan was routinely reviled, demeaned, dismissed, denigrated. Personally, of course, in terms of policy, he was smashed day in and day out by the press. And it was a different time, for sure, because there wasn't, you know, cable news, CNN had just started, but it wasn't this. It was for CNN was really actually much more fact based back then, early days, Ted Turner days, heady days in Atlanta. But there wasn't, you know, we didn't have talk radio, didn't have you know, any of the internet news sites, 
It was three channels. New York Times, Washington Post, etc. Uh, but he had to... He had to see this stuff. He, he, he didn't, it wasn't like he didn't read it or didn't hear Sam Donaldson screaming questions at him across the uh, South Lawn or the helicopters going. Like they're, they're always on his case, always. Didn't matter what he was doing. Didn't matter almost anything that he was doing. They were criticizing him. Uh, but he stayed above it for the most part, and he let it, for the most part, roll off his back i personally think that is generally the best way to go with the press i've been trashed in the press for 20 years and i don't care it does it doesn't prevent me from doing anything it doesn't stop me it doesn't worry me i'm not concerned because i mean i hate to it sounds like really haughty but i know i'm right about certain issues i know what i'm not an expert in but i know what i know and I'm very confident in what I know. So the fact that the New York Times or the Washington, you know, any of these, I'm not even trying to pick them out, but just any of these press organizations, it doesn't, doesn't bother me. It gets under the president's skin, no doubt. It is frustrating. It's most frustrating when you're in a room with your top advisors and three and a half months later, you have to read about that conversation especially distorted conversation in the New York Times, Politico, NBC News, whatever. You have to hear about it in a a meeting that includes classified information where you're discussing nuclear weapons, where you're discussing classified weapons programs. And you as a still political newcomer, he's, he's... Admitted, he's not a foreign policy expert, but he's smart. He has great political instincts. So he's gathering information. If I if I could guess on how that whole meeting went down that they wrote about, you know, when they said he, I want ten times the nuclear (laughs) nuclear force. I want the best. He was asking a lot of questions, and they all kind of, oh, could you believe? It was reported that he said he wanted ten times. He wanted a. Huge increase in the number of nukes, not understanding that this, even if that was possible, it would take years. to. So they use that leak to then dismiss and denigrate and demean him to further their narrative that Donald Trump is unfit for the presidency and that Bob Corker's right. He's on the verge of taking us to World War Three or that he has, quote, lost a step. Which we we've also heard. Now, this narrative is being set for one purpose and one purpose only. It's not to slow down the Trump agenda. It's not really even to stop the Trump agenda. It's to remove him from office. It's to trigger the 25th Amendment, where the cabinet removes the president from office. This narrative is being set by a press and by Republican establishment figures who never wanted him to be president would have been much more comfortable, not just with Jeb Bush or Marco Rubio, but with Hillary Clinton than Donald Trump. Okay, they didn't want Trump. They were rather Clinton. Clearly, McCain and Clinton were on the same page on foreign policy. They never saw a military intervention they didn't like. And they were much more on the same page when it came, came uh, come to trade, the like Trans-Pacific Partnership, immigration amnesty, on these key issues on which Trump was elected. They were in agreement with Hillary. And they never got over that. They want to remove Donald Trump from office. Now, he knows that. He gets that. The question is, what do you do about it? Do you proceed by calling into question the press's bias, Twitter, interviews, so forth, give speeches where you reference it, talk about taking away their licenses, or do you focus like a heat-seeking missile on the very policies and the 
substance on the issues that got you elected. If I were advising the president, this is what I would say. It's fine every now and then to have a glancing comment below at the media. It's fine. It may make it kind of funny. You know, a little little twinkle in your eye as you say it. A uh, little whimsical reference to, oh, well, you know, those. it's like a there you go again kind of comment. Meanwhile, as they're going about their biased reporting and their get Trump mentality, you, the president, are going about your work to make America great again. Now, he is doing that. He is do- I mean, th- just the progress they've made on trade alone, the, pr- the progress they've made on the- with the refugee situation, little fits and starts in the beginning with the travel ban, but nevertheless, they got that right, ultimately, and the court's not hearing the case. So that stands. What they've already done on judicial appointments and will continue to do, what they're doing, as I've said, on trade with Wilbur Ross and Bob Lighthizer, I mean, this is all really good stuff. What what he is now doing on, as we heard yesterday, on tax reform. This is all great stuff. Don't step on your own message. Don't get sidetracked. It's it's tempting, and I get it. I get it. I do understand. Because they are more unfair to him than they have been to any president in my memory, much, I think, worse than they were to Reagan. Of all the things, the shocking things the president has said, um, and he said so many, um, you know, call, you know, channeling Chairman Mao and Joseph Stalin by calling the media enemy of the people, um, saying that First Amendment rights, saying the ability of newspapers to write what they want to write is quote disgusting and someone should look into it, maybe the the most frightening. Uh, of 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 all, Joe Scarborough, who is part of the Remove Trump from Office wing of the American uh, media and so-called, well, former Republican, I guess now, he's helping develop and disseminate the establishment's talking points to remove Trump from office. He's their morning megaphone, and it's not like many people watch Morning Joe. But the the newsmakers, the decision makers who are on board with his analysis and his overall perspective that you, you got to get him out, get, I got, got to get him out. That forwards the narrative. His comments forward the narrative. Again, the question I'm asking all of you. Is this the way for Donald Trump to make progress and to avoid a potential catastrophe? A 25th Amendment trigger. I don't know, impeachment separate because that's the Mueller deal. I think it's as tempting as it is to beat the press. You defeat the bias by just being great yourself. They begin to look more and more absurd and ridiculous and untethered to reality when you don't give them the oxygen. Or you don't give them the opportunity to say, well, he doesn't understand that NBC doesn't have a license. That's not how it works. Or that's what dictators say. That's what Chairman Mao would say. That's what Putin would say. Shut down the press. Act against the press. That, to me, that's a bridge that, you know, we had, we had Sean Duffy, Congressman Duffy said that was a bridge too far. Duffy's a huge Trump supporter. He said the comment about the broadcast licenses takes it, is, is a bridge too far. I would agree. You have already accomplished a lot with almost no congressional help. So now don't step on your own success. Do do the good stuff you're doing now and do more of it. Put the pressure on Congress. Keep your head down. Keep a smile on your face. Every now and then you can make a little passing comment about the press. But they're not your problem. That they are not your main problem. We need points on the board. Tax reform needs to get done. The wall needs to get built. And we don't need any more sidetracks. We don't need any more side issues taking up all this media time. We want all the focus to be on substance, substance, substance. By the way, Ben Sass was, uh, of course, 
more than willing to pick up where all these people on MSNBC left off when yesterday he said uh, he made a nasty comment, of course, about Donald Trump, that he doesn't seem to even understand basic constitutional norms because of his comment about the press. Well, Ben Sass obviously know Ben Sass knows what Trump is really saying. He's just Trump's just really frustrated that the American people aren't getting the the whole story. And I think it's not just ego where Trump wants to be the president wants to be considered successful in the eyes of the elites. No, I think he actually is really frustrated for you. Everyone listening to this show right now, if you aren't somebody who already knows the political landscape. Imagine if you were someone who just checked in with the news cycle every now and then. Then you would hear a completely warped 90, 92% of the time negative view of Trump. He's frustrated because he knows that that demoralizes people. And it also turns people unfairly against the conservative populist agenda that will help this country and get us going in the right direction. He's frustrated. I don't blame him one bit. But I want him to be successful. In Billionaire at the Barricades, I lay out four strategies that Trump must employ in order to be a successful president. Uh, I bring you behind the scenes of many of my, my own interventions in the Republican Party over the past 30 years. And my work both for President Reagan, uh, going on my old law firm, making my way to the Supreme Court, working for Justice Thomas, uh, all the way to trying to advise Mitt Romney, uh, defeating the Bush amnesty, defeating Harriet Myers as a Supreme Court nominee, and how that all fit into this frame of how working people view this country and what they demand of our leadership, that the policies work for them, not for a thin veneer of elites, but a policies that our government pushes, enacts, advocates on foreign and domestic policy must work to the betterment of the ordinary American, the common man. That is what I believe. That is what we lay out in Billionaire at the Barricades. I'll be in Philadelphia tonight. I don't even know if we have any tickets left, but you can go to lauraingram.com and uh, check it out for yourself. Tomorrow, I'll be in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina at the end of the afternoon, kind of a 5.30 book signing at Barnes & Noble there. I'll be at Liberty University doing their convocation, which I think is not open to the public, but that'll be in the late morning tomorrow. And then I'll be in Washington, D.C. at the Values Voters Summit uh, in late morning on Saturday. And next week, we'll be with Kelly Ward and Steve Bannon in Scottsdale, Arizona. And we will also be uh, the next week in West Palm Beach at the Forum Club and adding other dates as time goes on uh, when I can fit it in with the planning of the new Fox show. So that's what's on our plate. I want you to buy this book now. I want you to read it. I want you to email, call us, tweet us about it. We're going to be talking about the right way forward uh, for this movement, for this president, and how to defeat our enemies. That huge credit bureau data breach a few weeks ago may have dropped off your radar, but your information may not have dropped off the dark web. Once your personal information is out there, thieves can then use it to steal your identity, months, even years after a breach. Fortunately, there's LifeLock Identity Theft Protection. Sign up today and they'll begin using proprietary technology to monitor your personal information for threats, including new accounts in your name, money being stolen from your 401k, or your information being sold on the dark web. And if there's a problem, their U.S.-based identity restoration specialist will work to fix it. No one can prevent all ID theft or monitor all transactions at all businesses. But LifeLock will look after your identity well after the last breach is long forgotten. Go to LifeLock.com or call 1-800-LIFELOCK today to get 10% off when you use the promo code LAURA. That's promo code LAURA, LifeLock.com or call 1-800-LIFELOCK today to get 10% off when you use the promo code LAURA. Willie Geist on MSNBC. Trump is now leading an authoritarian regime. That's not a, no overstatement there. Ben Sass, as a typical never Trumper that he is, uh, then tweets out that he wonders whether Trump is failing to preserve, protect, and defend the First Amendment. He says, uh, "Are you recanting the oath you took on January 20th to preserve, protect, and defend the First Amendment?" Yeah, Ben, that's what he's doing. Gentle Ben. Let's go to Ted in Georgia very quickly. Ted. 
Hi there. Uh, the, the narrative for the press is the water in the swamp. I feel that Trump fighting every one of these little ridiculous barrels, uh, battles is what allows him, it'll, it doesn't allow the press to claim victory every time they shut him down on some little garbage thing. It's, no. it's actually what's giving him the power over the narrative, and that puts pressure on the uh, representatives in Washington, because now I'm looking at my guy. I think it's really important to stay on point. We had this thing called message discipline in the Reagan White House, and it worked really well. One theme a day. Sometimes, you know, we have huge breaking news or some disaster that takes us off the message, but generally it's one message a day. Paul Ryan up next. If you've listened to my show for any period of time, you know how much I love food for the poor. They do what they say. Their financial integrity is unparalleled. Well, and I've seen their work personally. And right now, the people they serve need your help. As hurricanes, of course, recently just ravaged the Caribbean. And news reports, they stop or they get less frequent. And the camera crews, they pull out. But the suffering continues. And that's why I'm asking for your help, everybody. Because it's what we do as Americans. We do it best. We help people in need. So you can help save lives throughout the Caribbean. It's just $50 providing food for a year, water that's clean for life for a child. And a gift of 250 does the same for the size of an average family. So 250 a whole family gets taken care of for one year, clean water for life, and $50 uh, helps one child. Please help Food for the Poor. Call them, 844-868-4673. That's 844-868-4673. Or go to lauraingram.com. Click on that banner there. $50 or $250. Every gift matters. You are listening to The Laura Ingram Show, 855-40-LAURA. And, of course, the former Republican, Joe Scarborough, who has been on the impeach Trump bandwagon since about November 9th of 2016, has now uh, given fodder to the far left uh, to continue along the 25th Amendment, remove Trump from office, because now he's... Now he's going to shut down the press. Now he's going to take their licenses away. Now he's he's just no different from uh, from any two two bit dictator. He's Chairman Mao wrapped up with Putin, you know, wrapped up with an old Manuel Noriega, and then go to town on that. That's uh, this is p- pathetic. And Ben Sass, by the way, is basically if Joe Scarborough were a congressman or senator today, he'd sound a lot like Ben Sass. Ben Sass tweets out that, well, Mr. President, are you reneging on your um, on your uh, oath of office on January 20th? Because you you clearly aren't going to pr- protect, preserve and defend the First Amendment. Ben Sass is Ben Sass could not get arrested. For, no one even know who he is. Pathetic. Nebraska. I, I don't know if I can forgive Nebraska. For the Cornhusker kickback going back to Obamacare. Well, you are going back. Ben Nelson. And then Ben Sass, the two Bens from Nebraska, I don't like them either. Either of them cannot tolerate, okay? But Ben Sass, let's just to remind you, this is the kind of Republican we had before Trump, okay? This is the kind of Republican we've had to put up with for 25 years. The ones who put a knife in the back of conservatism every chance they get in order to cozy up to the New York. Option. Oh, and Ben, let's face it, you were, the, you were always the only option. He has that John Edwards uh, silky pony look, doesn't he, with that hair? It's kind of a silky <laughs> pony look. He's a little John Edwards. I don't mean on the personal stuff. I just mean the kind of boyish, boyish uh, good looks. But not, not good thinking. He knows that Trump's not acting act against the First Amendment. He's just using that to bash Trump. So if you're Trump, you're the president, you're annoyed by this. But you can't let it rattle you. You just can't let me talk about it. I'll talk about it. You go run the country. I'll expose the phonies and the frauds in, in both politics and the media. But, I mean, it, to some extent, this is why we like President Trump, because he calls out the frauds and phonies. As I said in my, elect, uh, my uh, RNC speech, calling out the frauds and phonies, and they never forgave him. And in the new book, Billionaire at the Barricades. Yeah, I, I kind of lay it all out. And uh, make sure you've your, gotten your copy. A lot of you pre-ordered, but too many of you did not. So get it now. 
And you'll go behind the scenes with me, not just in the 2016 election, but you'll also go behind the scenes with me all going all the way back to my breakfast with Richard Nixon, all the way through my lunch uh, with Trump, lunch with Trump, <laughs> all the way through. <laughs> Dinner with Reagan. Yeah, that's right. No, all Dinner the way, with Andre. All the, all the way uh, through my uncomfortable meeting with Ted Cruz mm. before he went out to give his non-endorsement. By the way, you have all five-star ratings from readers on Amazon. Oh, you do have I? all positive reviews. They, the, 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 your enemies mustn't have found the no, Amazon they, Okay, page don't give yet. any ideas. And it's a bestseller. So. Now, and we're, uh, we're very grateful. We're going to be in Philadelphia tonight. Uh, tomorrow we'll be at Liberty University. Also, Myrtle Beach, late tomorrow afternoon. Cocktails. Do Barnes & Noble have cocktails? Because I'm going to need one by the tomorrow <laughs> afternoon. I'm not drinking during the week <clears throat> at all. Uh, I, had a half, I had a half a glass of red wine after a long day yesterday. Raymond's like, no drinking during the week. I said, I just, could, I, could I just use it for a, you know, a mouth rinse at this point? <laughs> but I had a half a glass of red wine. And, of course, I was up at 1.15 and 4.15. You're like the and people 4:15. on the diet who eat the food and then spit it out. They don't swallow. They just chew it and just spit it out. <laughs> well, I got up at 1.15 and 4.15. It had nothing to do with the wine. I don't know. I cannot sleep. It's bad. I can see why Michael Jackson went into that oxygen chamber, whatever the hell he did. I mean, I don't want to end up like that, but I can see what you get. It's like a torture when you don't sleep. Madonna, send your oxygen I need a. I need an oxygen mask slash... They have a tent. It's a minus tent. the propofol or whatever that drug was that, God, <laughs> God bless him, uh, that he took. But it's tough when you can't sleep. I, I, you know what it is? I'm also not exercising because I'm just too busy. That, that kills well, me when I don't exercise. You're like a crazy person no, no, doing it's, all these hits. No, no, too much, too much, too much, too much. Uh, Adam Carolla is going to join us later on. Speaker Ryan is coming up in just uh, a matter of moments. You're not going to want to miss that. We're going to talk tax reform, the Trump agenda, and whether the, the whether uh, it's really correct, as Bob Corker said, that the, uh, the Capitol Hill is just worried about Trump's stability uh, and just a lot more. So, but we're focused on this tax reform issue because he he gave a great speech today at the Heritage Foundation, and he's all on this uh, pushing this the, these tax cuts. He's He's great on this stuff. He knows it. He's good on it. Uh, but we have we have uh, a couple other questions, too. So it's going to be a fun segment. Don't miss that. Um, 855 laura Questions for Speaker Ryan and uh, me when we come back. The law. We need a tax system that is fair to working families and that encourages companies to stay in America, grow in America, Spend in America and hire in America. Oh, the crowd went crazy. He spoke to the American uh, Trucking Association yesterday in Pennsylvania, a group that I know well. I used to write speeches for the Secretary of Transportation for the ATA. Great group of people. Joining us now, Speaker Paul Ryan, who gave a great speech at the Heritage Foundation pushing this tax reform plan. Got to get this done. Speaker Ryan, it's great to have you back on the show. How are you doing? Hey, hey, good to see you, Laura. Uh, thanks for having me back. I think that the president's speech was music to my ears. I mean, it's exactly what we need to do. Well, he he talked about the middle class getting hammered for years. They don't get the relief. Only a, a small slice of, of society seems to get uh, relief from the Congress. And uh, he, he had a rousing response from the crowd. And especially when he said, it's time to to basically, well, he didn't say it's time. He said the H and R block won't like me very much because it's going to be so easy right. for the most people to do their taxes. That's a simple message, Speaker Ryan, that everyone can understand. And and we put together this framework with the president and the Senate, and it's a, literally nine out of ten taxpayers under our plan can do their taxes on a postcard. And he's exactly right. The people who have all these loopholes snuck into the tax code um, are not going to like it. And that's why the speech I gave at Heritage today was saying, we're going to have an army of special interest to send upon Capitol Hill in a matter of days to try and defend the status quo, which, by the way, is a rigged deal where you know well-connected people, well-off people, can hire accountants and lawyers to navigate this code and get a good deal for them. But at least everybody else stuck with higher tax rates and higher taxes. So the whole purpose of this is to unrig the deal, unrig the economy, unrig the tax code, get rid of those loopholes, and just lower everybody's tax rates and simplify the system. Oh my God, simplify it's just, it 
Yeah, it's ridiculous. So you can do your taxes yeah. on a postcard and just pay lo- and just keep your money in the first place. That's it's the whole just, point of all. No, no, it's all too much. It's all too much, and it's just it, a man. He he went through the man hours that are wasted on tax preparation and consultants. All of that was great, and it looks like you guys are now working in tandem on this issue, Absolutely. right? And and it's different than yes. kind of it was to healthcare. I mean, House did its work on the healthcare reform, but well, uh, we, we stuff's with, getting log jammed in the Senate. Healthcare too, it's just. Yeah, the Senate kind of went sideways on us. So we, we worked in tandem with them on health care. As you know, we have passed 337 bills out of the House already this year, more under the Trump administration than under Obama, Bush, Clinton, and the other Bush. Yeah, but cause, cause Speaker um, Ryan, can't you use your leverage with Mitch McConnell? They, they well, on, 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 on the, supple- the supplemental uh, that you guys sent up to, to the Senate, was it 30, is it 30 something billion dollars, 36, 37 billion dollars? And, and you guys, and, and, and you guys are going to get this uh, back. It's going to be, it's going to be, uh, and it's going to be all uh, done. You guys are not going to have any, uh, not going to say on this, and and you're not going to have no reform in place with the supplemental, no offsets. That's well, that's what I'm concerned me, about. Where are the offsets, Speaker Ryan? I'll, I'll, I'll finish the sentence I was making, which was 274 of those 337 bills are still over in the Senate. So we we got more work to get done over there to get this agenda passed um, on the supplemental. Um, this we're passing the bill the president asked us to pass. We're passing the bill just as was drafted and requested by the president's uh, management and budget office. And, and, and the issue of this supplemental is this is very much of an emergency. It's, it's to the emergency funds for the flood insurance program, which runs out of money in a matter of days, when people are literally tearing down sheetrock in Houston, um, this, this is the fund that helps them do that. And the FEMA disaster fund, which because of another Hurricane Maria, they've burned through that money so fast. So this is a very temporary kind of a stopgap measure, and we're passing the very bill the president is asking us to pass and keeping it clean to that here in the House. But we can do offsets, right, our- Speaker? I'm sorry to interrupt, but we have limited time. Absolutely. This is where but, but, you guys have the authority. This is You guys are the appropriators. Senate can't just jam this thing through because everybody's, oh, you know, Puerto Rico, hurricanes, uh, it, without yeah. any offsets. This is where you guys have the authority, and you have the knowledge because you've been there for so long. That that with this flood insurance program, people can't get a free pass after three floods take their houses, you know, their houses away. You can't just get keep getting rebuilt by the federal government. Well, but the flood insurance program runs out of money in days, and the reauthorization um, we're getting into the weeds here expires in December, and so it's the reauthorization of this program where we're pushing those reforms. So we've got a number of reforms we're pushing for the flood insurance program so that it can be self sufficient, and so that just like you said, it doesn't encourage. Yeah, people it's a nightmare. continually rebuild in the in the wrong places, which harms them themselves. But putting that aside, um, you asked me about getting things through the Senate. Um, the reason we are so excited and bullish on tax reform is because we're going to use the tool, which you, it's about once a year you get to use this thing called reconciliation, where they can't filibuster. You know those those 274 bills we got sitting over the Senate. Um, those bills can be filibustered. That means Chuck Schumer can st- wage a filibuster and require 60 votes and gum up the works, which is what he's doing. And on tax reform, because we'll put it through what we call reconciliation, Chuck Schumer can't filibuster it. The, the Senate cannot filibuster it. You can tell Chuck Schumer you're not going to appropriate any money for his pet projects unless he starts moving these bills through, right? I mean, you can, you can play hardball with the Senate. I mean, you're, 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 Paul Ryan is an extremely nice person. We do play hardball with the Senate. And like I said, we're stacking, we're racking and stacking here in the House. We're doing our jobs. We pass Kate's yep. Law. We pass Sanctuary Cities. We pass Repeal and Replace of Dodd-Frank. We pass Repeal and Replace of, of Health Care. Uh, we pass yep. our budget, which balances the budget and pays down the debt. So we're doing our job here in the House, and we're just pushing, pushing, pushing. The and they have a different system in the Senate. Yeah. The president today, us, Speaker Ryan, yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt, but the yeah. uh, president oh, today on. said we can't keep FEMA, the military, and the first responders, who've been amazing, in Puerto Rico forever. Uh, and and that's, people are going crazy because he's saying that. But isn't it, isn't it the case that we can't afford this? And at some point, America gets weaker and weaker and weaker the more we have to borrow from China and Japan and Germany or print money to pay for things that, with money we don't have. And, and you this guys have to be the fiscal stewards here and be as hard as it is pe- for people to hear. We can't put a state of the art power grid in, in Puerto Rico. Maybe we can help rebuild, but we don't have a limitless supply of uh, taxpayer dollars. 
This is why we have to have entitlement reform, which is what is driving our budget into its crisis in the future. And that's why getting repeal and replace done in law is so important. It's not just the fact that Obamacare is failing. It's that the health care entitlements are what drive us to a bankruptcy. So that the more we can reform the big spending programs in the federal government, the better we are on a fiscal Yeah, it's a standpoint. long ball. The more we can... That's a long ball. It's a long ball. ball. But it's, it's, it is, you're asking about borrowing money and, and funding right. emergencies. And but can you attach so those reforms to these relief packages? Can't you, can't you nail those reforms right into relief packages? Like, we're going to help, but these uh, are the reforms in place. Technically speaking, I won't get into the details on entitlements. You, you can't. It's, they're separate. This is discretionary spending. Um, it's not entitlement spending. Um, that's, what, that's why repeal and replace was so important, yeah. because that was the biggest entitlement reform bill Congress has ever passed, the, pat, the bill we joke. passed in May. And unfortunately, the bill that they have not been able to pass yet in the Senate. Congressman Duffy just said a few minutes ago on the show that you all don't get tax reform uh, passed. It's going to be a 20, uh, 2006 wipeout in uh, the House and the Senate. Do you agree with him? I think we need to keep our word. And I think the economy is ready to take off if only we get government off of people's backs. And that starts with getting people more of their own money by cutting taxes and reforming the code. I think he's right, which is... The country needs this. The country is expecting this. And we made a commitment, and we need to keep that commitment. Paul Ryan, Speaker of the House, we really appreciate your coming on and spending some time with our listeners. Thank you so much. Uh, Keep it going.